All right, then, if you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to Ezra, Ezra chapter 10, and we're going to begin reading in verse 10. Ezra chapter 10, beginning in verse 10. The Bible says, And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from strange wives. And all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so, so must we do. But the people are many, and it is a time of much rain, and we are not able to stand without, neither is there work for one day or two. For we have many that have transgressed in this thing. Let now our rulers of all the congregation stand, and let all them which have taken strange wives in our cities come at appointed times, and with them the elders of every city, and the judges thereof, until the fierce wrath of our God for this matter be turned away from us. Only Jonathan, the son of Aziel, and, Jeh and Jehaziah, the son of Tikvah, were employed about this matter, and Meshulam and Shabethanite Levite helped them. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your blessed holy word. Lord, we thank you for its standing true in a day of attack when it's minimized and replaced with other versions that we are able in this land to hold tight to it. We pray that you would grant us strength in the days ahead to do just that, to cling to the Bible as you've given it for English-speaking people. God, we pray tonight that you would bless this word to the hearts of the hearers. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Now, before we get started, I meant to mention this uh, as a quick aside. As most of you, I guess all of you know, uh, Adam and Donna and um, Madison put on some songs on our Facebook for uh, the last time Donna and I looked, I think Madison's had 515 views. And uh, that's great encouragement. And uh, uh, I told her she just got to use it for the Lord and the Lord will recognize it. And, um, and that also means that the website is getting views as well. All right, let's back to our text now. And if you know the book of Ezra, you know what was happening in this situation. Uh, they were reclaiming the land. They had been given permission by the king of Babylon to go back and rebuild the cities, and rebuild the temple, and set things up the way that they used to be. Now, anytime you think about something, and sometimes people say, I get too much stuck in the past, but what I found, nine times out of ten, the things, the way the things used to be is better than they are now. And such was the time of Ezra, and we'll find out why just in a moment, but in the days before they were captured and taken to Babylon, things were better then than they are now. And you know, sad to say, but true it is, I, I, I think about 30 years ago, or even 35 years ago, 36 years ago, soon will be, that I started uh, attending at Bumpus Mills Baptist Church Think of what change that has occurred in 36 years. And you say, well, Brother Larry, that's a lifetime. And I, I'll agree with you. That's more than a lifetime, more than a generation. But my challenge to you tonight is this. Think about 36 years in the other direction. Where will we be? Did you in your wildest, most ungodly thoughts ever think we would live in a nation like we do today. You know what? Life means nothing these days. It, it really doesn't. Life, uh, life of children, uh, it, it's just a passion thing. 
And so that was much as it was. Really, that's what took them to Babylon. That's why they were consumed by sin. Uh, they were even offering their babies up uh, to sacrifice. And so we see that because of that, the judgment of God came against them. They were in Babylon, now they're back. Remember the cupbearer? He says, why is thy countenance so sad? And he took the opportunity and told them about the land of Israel. Now, with that, they got permission to go back, and they began to rebuild the city as it was in the days of David. And then they find a problem. Now, when you're rebuilding anything, you're going to find a problem. Now, uh, this little house under the hill, I told you I heard it sold for $260,000 down here where Adam and Sarah used to live. Now, I can tell you of a surety it wasn't the house, but uh, there's uh, almost eight acres down there. Yeah. And uh, But I was thinking about the little house, and you know what? It was in a lot worse shape than it looked like. We'd have been a whole lot better off to strike a match and set it on fire and buy the kids a truck. But this is what we found. The deeper we dug, the more problems we found. And I broke a leg down there. And uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was a very, very intense job. And we, we finally got to the bottom of it and literally we had to take entire floors out, joists and everything. I mean, nothing left. But see, we had to get down to the problem before we could fix the problem. And, and I think today in age, and, uh, they're, they're renewing the store uh, down there where we don't live at, at Bumpus Mill, and they're taking, up the, they're taking up the floor, and they're all the way down to the joist, and they're putting in a new floor in that store. And I told the kid, his name is Brandon, I said, I said, Brandon, won't you just put uh, uh, plywood over that? Well, all that would do, Mr. Larry, is cover up the problem. And you know what? Brandon's right. And I think we've done that a lot too long among God's people. And, and, and so we find then that Ezra gets down to a, 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 a root problem in the nation of Israel. Verse 10, And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed, that means gone against the law of God, and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now, what is a strange wife? And some of us might say, hey, I'm involved in that. Right? Strange wives. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, but that's not what he meant. He meant wives outside of Israel. He meant taking in heathen wives. He meant taking in people that did not follow God in any way, who did not even recognize who God was. These were strange wives. And you know, you know who started that little cascade of events? It was Solomon himself. He, he had so many wives, he couldn't count them. And he began the transgression, and it went on to the days they left for Babylon. The base problem was not an easy problem to fix. You know, we live in a day and age, I would dare to say, the majority of people, the majority even of God's people, they don't want to get to the base problem. They don't want to get down to the joist. They don't want to get down to where the dirt is at. They'd rather smooth her over. And so we find that Ezra says, this is the base problem. You have a mixed multitude. You have a people that love God, and you have a people that hate God. Verse 11. Now, therefore, make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers, and do his pleasure, and separate yourselves. Now, Everybody always bristles up when you get down to separation. But I want you to see it's a Bible doctrine all the way back. All the way back to the beginning is a doctrine of separation. 
Now, why is it? You know what? This is what I found. You'll act like the people you're around. I've seen it time and time and time again. It's not that we'll look like freaks. It's not that we'll be different than everybody else. It's for your spiritual good. It's for, you know, how are you going to have a good spiritual appetite if you're eating everything the world has to offer? You know, when we get old and get sick, they always put you on some kind of diet, right? You can't have, when you're a diabetic, can't have the con pie anymore. You gotta take a very little swivel of it, right? And why, why would you do that? Because it's healthy for you. It's the right thing to do. So what we select and put up here, and more importantly that we put right here, is going to impact your spiritual health. We need to be a separated people. We don't need what the world has to offer. Now, with that thought, I want you to think about it. Which would you rather have, rye bread or pecan pie? Right? I know what I would like. Don's going to take the rye bread, not me. I'm going to take the pecan pie. And you know why? Because it's sweet and crunchy and it's very, very good. But what's the benefit? You know, and, and when you're a diabetic, and I can say that, I've about outgrown mine. I don't know if you could do that. But, uh, one thing that would send my sugar through the ceiling in the early months after my brain surgery was a biscuit. I could eat a piece of pie, and it, it would weevil a little bit, but one time I ate a biscuit and I was working home health and had to run down to Cumberland City and see a patient, and I just got that uh, feeling about halfway to Cumberland City, pulled over, took my sugar, it was 260 from eating a biscuit. You know what, after that, what I had to be careful of? Biscuits. Brother Junior, he may have something else that runs his up. And the next diabetic may have something else. And you know what? It's simply learning yourself, is it not? Spiritually, I think the same is true. We need to learn ourselves. We need to study ourselves. Uh, learn that one, the, the Bible calls it to be set in sin, is what the Bible calls it. Find that one thing that it all costs you need to avoid. And, and that's what the problem was here. They took in these women, and no, lot, no doubt they looked different, they dressed different, they, they had an air about them that was very attractive to the flesh, but they were not Jewish. And God charged them for it. God pointed out through the mouth of Ezra, you gotta be separate. You gotta avoid these things. Why do we have to avoid things? Because they'll bring you down. You wanna be down spiritually? Now, be very, if you don't get anything else out of the message tonight, get this. There's a world of difference between how you feel and how you're doing spiritually. Because you know what? Sin makes you feel good. Newsflash, right? Mm -hmm. Emotionally, you may be at the top of the clock, but see, that don't mean spiritually where you need to be. Separation is not about looking stupid. Separation is protecting your relationship with Christ. Now, I'm not talking about keeping yourself safe. But what does the Bible say in, uh, I think it's 1 Peter, maybe James, maybe James. You draw nine to me and I'll draw nine to you. So how are we going to do that if something's in the way? If I want to get over here close to Joey, what's in my way? The end of an overcue. 
If we want to get close to Christ, what's in the way? That, that, is, the, that is the clinch of separation, is, is, is separating your, your, your life so you'll be close to God. Now, it will always come at a price. Separate yourselves from the people of this land and from the strange wives. Now, you think about whether strange, uh, again, all puns aside, that just means non-Jewish. Like I said earlier, in August, me and Donna will be have married 36 years. That is unreal to me. But, can you imagine us separating now? Now, just because they were ungodly people didn't mean that, did not mean that the Jewish men did not love them. You see what I'm saying? They could have had a very sound marriage. They could have been deeply in love with their pagan wife. So the next thing we find about separation is that it hurts. You know, I, I, I've always heard ever since I, I came into true Baptist churches that living a separate life and you'll feel good about it. Have you found that to be true? I haven't. I've been called names. I've had, you know, and this is where, and we're talking about wives again, but it goes for other family members too. There were several years that I had almost no contact at all with my own family because I didn't need to know, I didn't need to be around what they were doing. You know what? That hurts. Besides Donna, Judy was my very best friend. Thank God I, she got things halfway right before she died. So could you imagine not speaking to your sister for five years? That hurts, doesn't it? It's against nature. Listen to this. Nature will get you into trouble every time. Doing what's natural is not what you want to do. And, and so they were having to set these wives apart and not have anything to do with them anymore. Uh, why? For the glory of God, so that relationship could be restored. Verse 12, And all the congregation and answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so, we, so must we do. Now I've been pastor for years, been preaching uh, almost for 30 years, and you know what? I've never, ever heard that reply from any church I've ever preached at. But see, they were, they had it in their minds to serve God. Remember, just in two chapters before this, when Ezra rose up and, and he read the law, they all began to cry, and they stood for hours. You know how many churches today, when they read the Word of God, they ask the congregation to stand, which I'm fine with that. And no doubt that's what the Jews did. You can't argue that with the Bible at all. But can you imagine standing for six hours and just heard the Word of God read and it be so moved that you're ready to change whatever's necessary? That's the move of God, is it not? That's the move of the Holy Ghost. Uh, people don't do that on their own. It takes the move of God. And, and, and so we find at this great message that Ezra preached, they were ready to move on what he said. We find our situation very many times in verse 13. But the people are many. Now, here we find people, I would say in the modern day, more frequently, it's things. Right? I spend way, way too much time on this. Sometimes I just have to separate myself from it. I'll lay it in there in our bedroom on my nightstand. 
and, and just get away from it because I, I, I found myself just scrolling and scrolling. And you know, there, it wasn't too many years ago, I was looking at teenagers, my boys say, what are, what are they doing all the time? And now I'm doing it too. You see what I'm saying? Is it exceedingly sinful? No. Does it take time from my wife and my girls and more importantly from the Lord? You betcha. And it doesn't have to be excessive. You know, we think of sin, and no doubt this was the situation. Uh, we think of sin with fornication and adultery. And here it says that huh, it's going to take time. In other words, whatever our obstruction, number one, it will be something you love. And it's going to take a little bit to get rid of it. It's going to take a little time. Now, this you will only do if you cherish your relationship with Christ. Now, if your relationship with Christ is down here, you'll run right through it and never think another thing about it. Right? But if you cherish that and you desire that and you want him to be the leader and you want, him, and you want that closeness, this is the result. But the, but the people were many and it is at a time of much rain. <laughs> now, as an aside, this was true in this situation. But you know what Mama used to say? Any excuse is better than none. It's raining outside. Well, but if somebody came to the door, you'd open it, right? If the ox got in the ditch, you'd run out there in the rain and get him out. So we find the next piece of this is priority. Now, we live in a day and age today where our priority can be summed up in one word, money. That's priority, right? Sometimes out of necessity and sometimes out of greed, right? You got to, you know, I've been, and if you look at my post on Facebook, I've been following, and it, it's genuine. The price of food is 40% higher than it was when Biden took office. Now, what does that mean? That means if we were buying, buying bread for a buck fifty before he took office, we're paying over $2 for it. Me and Donna, and, and, and Donna's a frugal grocery buyer, and, and what I have seen, she's not spending money, any more money than she did really on groceries, but she's bringing home a lot less. Does that make sense? The same money we used to spend and, and come home with me and the girls, I always would be out there and going up and down in the eight steps and bringing food in and up and down and up and down. We can get her done in two trips now. Part of it's priority, but part of it's because it's what we want, right? Think about the stuff you bought in the last year, and how much of it was need, and how much of it was want. How much of it was both? Now, me and Donna love our, our, our cellar behind the house, the root cellar. I'm not going to tell you what I paid to have that built. Now, it, has it been a service? You betcha. We got places to store our vegetable and our dry and our, our, our dried potatoes and everything's back there and it's all tucked away in one little place. But it's one of those things that was both. Was it a priority? Probably not. Was it needful? Maybe not. Probably not. You see what I'm saying? So then we have to be, begin to prioritize what keeps us close to Christ and what separates us from Christ. What was separating these men was their pagan wives. What's separating you? I don't know. But you do. Right? And, and so we find that we as the Lord's people, people who are genuinely regenerated by the blood of Christ, that is our priority. 
That, and you know what? What I have found is genuinely born again people, they'll do what's necessary. They'll do whatever the cost to be near unto Christ. What did John the Apostle say? Lord, is it I? He wanted to be that close to Christ, didn't he? You know what? He didn't even trust himself enough to say, I'm not the traitor. He was dependent on Christ, right? You know what that says about me? If John the Apostle didn't know himself well, I certainly don't know myself well. Right? How close are you to Christ? How near are you unto Christ? And what's it worth to you? What's the value of being close to Christ? And I'll answer you that it's everything. It is everything to be close to Christ. It's worth all the sacrifice a lifetime could afford just to be near the bosom of Christ. It is worth it. Now, in the modern day, this is the modern day, you can do what you want to and still be close to Christ. No, no, no. That is a lie right out of the pits of hell. Separate, right? Different. A lot of these new age churches, it sounds like the rock concerts. I used to go down in the, in, in the center in Nashville and hear ZZ Top. Same trash, right? Get you moving, get you feeling good, right? Come out from among them and be separate. I don't need that stuff. You don't need that stuff. You know what? If it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck, right? And if it looks like the world, acts like the world, and sounds like the world, it's probably pretty worldly, isn't it? Come out from among them and be separate. And, and, and so we find the, the critical piece here, the question to answer is, how important to you is a close relationship with Christ? What, what does it mean to you? That, that's really, because listen, you won't be able, uh, you won't even be moved to give up anything if Christ is not authority, it doesn't matter to you. It is not something that is high on the list of priorities. And it will not happen until Christ is first. And when Christ is first, listen, you'll, you'll throw up your hands and say, hey, it's worth the cost. It's worth, it's worth everything if I can lay on his bosom. For the people are many, and it is a time of much rain. And we are not able to stand without, or meaning outside, neither is the work of one day or two, for we are many that have transgressed in this thing. Now, let me give you uh, the Stewart County version of that. It's raining every few days. On the dry days, we've got to hit the field. We don't have time to deal with this right now. <coughs> And you'll tell yourself that again, and again, and again. And you know what? One day you'll look up, and you'll start seeing gray right here. You'll look up and see where you'd rather take your mower down to the beehives than walk. <laughs> right? It goes by very quick, does it not? And what have you gained by not putting Christ first? Now this is where it gets difficult, and you know, you know the rest of this event. They did is that they were covered. It was hard and it was difficult, but they give them up. And whatever you're facing tonight, you know what? I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult, but you need to give it up. You know when. Uh, me and Donna Mary, my friends, weren't the best kind of people to be around. And what I found, first of all, if I was going to be a good servant 
at Bumpus Mills Baptist Church, they had to go. He said, oh, they weren't such bad people. I didn't say they were bad people. I, I, I was saying they negatively influenced me. They negatively put things in my life that I didn't need to be there. You know what? This is the sad truth. Four of them are dead now. Four out of five. I'm only 55 years old and I'm the oldest one of all. Sin will bring us down, will it not? The, the first one, second one that died, Roger, he was just a, uh, it was something to be around. Funny, just, just fun to be around. He died at 50 years old with end-stage liver disease. He literally drank himself to death. You know what, though? I still think when the day before Adam was born, him and Steve, he was the first to die. I have to say, Steve, his death was not the result of his actions. A drunk driver hit them head on and it killed Steve. But Steve and Steve and Roger came down to our apartment in Dresden. We were going to nursing school. And uh, Donald was starting to show some signs of labor. And you have to know Roger to do this. And Steve was sick. I had to take Steve to the emergency room. I'm like, anytime he gets somebody gets around me, they get sick. And so I had him in the ER trying to get something for strep though. And Donald was, Donald tells Roger, I think I might be having a baby. Uh, starting to head in like he just flipped out. <laughs> I mean, he was just, but it was a joy to be around. But what I found, as fun as that was, I couldn't let him be in my life. Greg, my friend, his funeral I preached last year, same thing, just, just fun to be around. See, sin is always fun, isn't it? I and mean, think about it, it really is. But what I could have, he was, even then, 35 years ago, he was horribly addicted to drugs. It took his life eventually. But I didn't need to be around it. You see what I'm saying? But those guys were my best friends. You see what I'm saying? It hurt to give them up. I still think about them today. But it had to be just that way. Separation is not a piece of cake. Separating yourself from the bad influences of this world is not an easy task. But dear friend, it's very much a necessary task. If Christ is first, he has no competition. He's either the very top or he's not at all. Even your relationship with your wife or your husband has to be second to your relationship with Christ. And you know what? That's a very difficult thing to do. Me and Donna have been together so long, we know what each other's thinking. But you know what? Christ has got to exceed Donna, doesn't he? That's hard. So we find that the biggest negative influence, and all, you, you think about this, all these other things that, that occur in our life really stem from friends that we have in our life, right? You start drinking, you start smoking, you start doing drugs, it's usually because that's the people you hang around with. You don't usually come up with your own, you know, gee, I think I'm going to start drinking today, right? because who you're with. So my advice to you tonight, put Christ first. And if there's anything between you and him, when you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, high and lifted up on his throne, is there anything obscuring your view? Is there anything between you and him? And if there is, get rid of it. And often it's the things we least suspect that's buying and desires your attention. 
he got to be first. 